Hi, welcome to the NEOS revolution. It's been one year since the last NEOS conference and um, let's have a look at the NEOS 5.0 Flow 6.0 versions and what has happened until today, basically. So NEOS 5.0 came out September 2019. Uh, it was the next release after the conference 2019. Uh, then we had 5.1 in December 2019, and finally uh, 5.2 in April 2020. And now we are working on the next LTS 5.3, obviously. So let's have a look at the flow evolutions that happened in those versions. Um, I will not uh, split up the changes between the different versions, uh, but give you an overview of what is the current state if you install the NEOS 5.2 um, compared to uh, 4.3, for example. Um, between uh, the single versions, uh, obviously different things happened, but I will not uh, split that up. Um, so Flow has undergone uh, quite some major changes uh, for the 5.0 especially. Um, first things first, uh, we up we upped the version requirement to PHP 7.2, which is already in security change mode only by now. Um, so we will see how we proceed with that, but we are obviously compatible with 7.3 as well. And we are looking into 7.4. I think we are pretty much uh, ready for that too. So PSR3 logging. This is not new for uh, Flow 6.0, uh, but was already introduced before. Um, and there was a quite a long time um, for deprecation of the old logging, uh, which is now gone. So that is the major part for the PSR logging in uh, Flow 5.0. Um, the old logging is completely gone. That means uh, you should change your own code to the new style PSR3 logging. Um, I think a couple of things were said about PSR3 logging um, before in previous talks, even in the last conference. Um, basically, PSR3 is a standard. Um, the famous monolog logger is a package implementing the standard. So um, I recommend having a look at that um, if you need more extensible uh, logging options, then the monolog package is a great way. And now it's super easy to add it to an installation. Basically, you just install it and uh, configure a factory for it. And um, off you go with your monolog logger. So all flow logging is now fully PSR3. Um, there's uh, one important thing besides monolog uh, that you can now do. Um, and uh, a couple of things to watch for, uh, especially exception logging slash tracing. That is probably the one thing that many people need to change in their installations when they upgrade. Um, this was deprecated as well. Uh, the reason being, and um, there was quite some talk about this, uh, PSR3 doesn't know anything about exception logging. Uh, it's a concept that we had in Flow that you could use a logger for example, the system logger and say log exception and um, yeah, basically get your exception logged. Uh, that was nice and it worked well. Um, but um, the problem is uh, PSR is really only for logging. And if you look at how the exception uh, stacks are saved, um, that is not a log entry, but a single file. Obviously, there's also a log entry that points to that single file. That is still logging. But the single file with the stack trace and the additional request information, that is not logging. Um, so we came, out with the, came up with the concept of an exception storage. And there's a new interface for that, which also exists since a while. And so basically, if you actually want to log an exception, you have to inject this interface additionally to your logger as well. Um, so then you can use uh, the exception storage to store the exception, and it gives you back a message that is basically the log message that you can then put in your log or the system log uh, that points to the file where the 
uh, exception was, uh, was traced. Um, this also allows you to implement different ways of storing exceptions besides the default file system uh, storage. Um, so you could put your exception traces in um, whatever you want, um, an Elasticsearch, for example, uh, for further, um, further analysis. All right, um, let's go on. I think uh, logging is clear. You definitely need to change your code if you used uh, the old logging um, a lot. Um, the signature of logging has slightly changed, but nothing major. Uh, should be needed for you unless you need exception logging. So um, together with that, we now have a virtual object configuration that is actually super great for this because uh, it allows you to configure uh, a virtual object, for example, a logger. Uh, previously for loggers, we had those interfaces like the system logger interface. Those were kind of uh, marker interfaces, virtual interfaces, there was no object attached. It was all done by configuration uh, and pointed to the system logger or the security logger. Um, to simplify this concept and make it more abstract and therefore more accessible for your own code, we came up with the idea of virtual object configurations. Um, so basically any object with a specific object YAML configuration can become its own object that you can inject afterwards. Um, I created a quick code example. There are a couple of code examples in this talk, but um, it should be fine even if you don't read code. Um, I will I just have it in here as a reference for you and uh, the listeners to have an idea of what I'm talking about if uh, they are coders. So uh, this example configures some package security logger um, which in essence is a PSR logger that uh, has a specific name called security logger. So this is now a virtual object. Um, obviously it's not a class name, uh, but still it's now accepted by the object manager. So if you say object manager get some, uh, some package uh, security logger, that would give you this configured object. Uh, but uh, you can also use it in the inject annotation like this. Um, and now you have your security logger injected, uh, which means um, the configuration is uh, no longer so hidden in the object's YAML, it's still there, but you can reuse it easily. And um, you actually have a reference point in your code that um, points to the object's YAML. So if you search for some package security logger, you will find the injections and you will find the object configuration. Uh, so you get the whole idea how it's uh, put together. So then uh, we go further on to um, the whole request stack. A lot has changed there. Um, and we will go into that into a bit more detail. But first of all, uh, request body mapping is a single feature that um, I also wanted to have for a long time. And the basic idea is uh, if you ever had incoming JSON for a controller action in Flow, um, Flow would try to map this JSON to arguments automatically. Um, so for example, this, um, let's say API v1 foo is a route in your package that goes to this foo, foo action. Um, the JSON you see would uh, map to the, um, to the variable foos because that's one of the keys in the delivered object. Uh, so that worked, that worked before, nothing new here. This is something you could have used uh, since basically first version of Flow, I guess. Um, now this is a different case. If you look closely, the JSON is not an object, it's an array. So um, that's kind of a problem because there's no keys. So Flow can't map it. And actually, um, depending on, on the code and everything, this um, would totally blow up your code and uh, the, uh, the application because um, in previous versions, Flow just simply couldn't map this JSON and it would, uh, would accept. 
uh, I think we fixed that at some point. So now you could actually run this code, but foos would not be mapped, obviously, because it doesn't know this, this should be foos. Uh, so you'd have to look into the request body yourself um, and extract this JSON yourself. Um, so the idea was to make this more easily configurable so you can actually um, use this functionality that we already had since a long time for whatever JSON is incoming, which most of the time you cannot control because it's coming from some external services. So um, now we have this. Uh, we have the new uh, map request body um, annotation uh, that you can tell which argument variable the request body should be mapped to. And it will map the whole, the whole request body. It could be an object or an, an array or just a string. As long as it's valid JSON, uh, we will map the result of the JSON decode into the given variable name. So this works now, and you would get the array foos in the variable foos. Um, as said, works with all kinds of uh, different JSONs. So uh, have a look at that if you if you have incoming JSON. That's certainly helpful, right? But the big thing in the whole stack of um, HTTP and requests is the change to PSR seven. There was some preparation in the pre five zero six zero flow six zero versions, um, but we figured that. Uh, we would have to be breaking anyway, and there's a lot of um, stuff happening on the upper layers that influences that. So we had to take everything apart and um, change how it works together. Uh, PSR 7 is again standard for an HTTP implementation that is implemented by other tools. Big example in this case would be Guzzle, um, the um, HTTP client. Um, which many use to do requests to other servers. And now um, we basically use PSR7, which is also used by Gazelle. So um, you can directly put requests into Gazelle and get the responses, and it works flawlessly with everything in Flow. Um, and actually, we decided to not implement the basic PSR7 classes, the HTTP classes, request, response, uh, message, and so on. But we use the Gazel HTTP uh, PSR7 implementations. Um, so specifically, Gazel, we are 100% compatible, but as it's a standard, uh, you should be fine with any uh, PSR7 implementation. And throughout the core code, uh, we now only rely on the respective interfaces of the power PSR 7 standard. So um, we, we created a strong separation between the HTTP layer and your controller MVC uh, action request response layer. Before, there was some separation, but especially in the response part, um, we mostly used the HTTP response throughout the MVC layer. And that was kind of dangerous, and especially now with uh, PSS7. Uh, PSS7 is um, uh, immutable objects, so a request and a response um, can only be mutated by creating a new instance with the changed um, arguments, with the changed properties. So um, in many cases, with pulling the HTTP response throughout the MVC layer, we relied on um, object references, and that doesn't work anymore for PSS7. Um, it also made the code ha quite hard to understand because the, PS the HTTP response could be manipulated in so many places that it was hard to keep track of what act was actually happening there. So um, with this change, we have a clear separation and um, we have compatibility with all the tools that use PSR7. Um, it's an understood standard. There's a lot written about it. Um, so it's also easier for external devs to, to get into that. And I tried to create a small um, diagram of how it works now. Um, I have no diagram of the old version. Uh, that would be way more complicated. And um, I don't want to explain so much in detail. But um, as I said, we have a strict separation now. The HTTP chain 
or rather low level of flow core um, creates the HTTP request, the PSR7 request actually. Um, from that, an action request is created and given to your controller. This is the main request. Now the controller does whatever the controller does. Uh, it can read the action request. It cannot sensibly change the action request, which would not make sense anyway, because it's coming from the outside. Um, it might create a sub request that happens, for example, for plugins in uh, Fusion in NEOS, or also for um, view helpers in certain cases, uh, for, for um, uh, yeah, for various cases, there are sub requests. And a sub request uh, means we create an action request that is based on the parent action request. Uh, a similar concept existed before. Um, but there will also be a new action response. The action response is completely new now. Um, and the action response doesn't know its parent at all. It's just an empty response. So um, your controller would in some ways, directly or indirectly, create a, a sub-action request. Um, the sub-controller would get this sub-action request, which still has its lineage and knows the parent request and also the HTTP request. Um, and then um, the sub-controller would be responsible for cre creating or rather filling the action response, which is empty at that point. And then this action response goes back to the main controller or the main controlling code, let's say, that can be a, a plug-in manager or um, a fusion runtime or whatever. And in that place, um, this action response from the sub request is then merged into the response of the main request. Um, so before we would just have the same HTTP response everywhere and you would just manipulate that and now you have your separate action response. You write into that, it goes to the controlling code, that merges it to its own response, which is usually an action response, and then that is handed back at some point to, into the HTTP chain, the low-level core, where the final action response is then merged to the empty-ish HTTP response that we have at that point uh, and then delivered to the client. Um, so that allows us a, a bit more control and separation. Um, the action response has specific methods for some of the things you need to do with HTTP, uh, although we didn't want to make it too much of an HTTP response because it's actually MVC layer and it's way more high level. So we wanted to separate this a bit and um, uh, give it a bit different meaning uh, of being a high level thing that um, is at some point possibly delivered to a browser. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of change in there. You probably need to adapt your code if you uh, deal a lot with the action or the HTTP response. Um, the underlying ideas are all the same. Your action request has merged arguments. Um, you can still access HTTP requests, all that. Um, there's, uh, there's a lot of change, but also a lot of the same. Uh, it's just better separated. Um, overall, uh, this gives a lot of clarity for c in the code. And we are now working to get um, HTTP PSR 15 in, which, um, which allows you to use um, handlers for HTTP requests, for PSR 7 requests uh, in Flow. There exist handlers uh, out there, uh, simple small objects um, similar to a logger uh, that can handle an HTTP request in a certain way and uh, do something with it. Um, also, this change opens the possibility for us to have um, ways to bypass the whole action MVC layer, which is quite heavy, let's say, because the um, mapping, the argument mapping, and also the validation um, uh, take a lot of time, usually. So um, if, you, if you don't need that, you could hook into the HTTP chain, low-level um, HTTP core, and directly access the HTTP request, uh, do something with it, and deliver a HTTP response, which is way faster. And we will come to an example later um, for something that does this. 
All right, then uh, cash garbage collection uh, has been improved. Um, we had some problems and uh, in this case where um, there was no easy way to trigger garbage collection for all caches. This is now implemented, just a small thing, but it's super helpful if you ever looked into the cache layer of a big application. Uh, you will see there's lots of stuff lying around, especially if you need if you use the file-based caches. Right, then you have split configuration. We started that already. Um, node types, for example, was always splittable. So you know you have this node types dot um, my content dot yaml and so on. Um, we added that for settings as well. And actually every configuration is now splittable um, to your taste. So um, if you have big configuration files, uh, make use of that and split them up to easier find the places you need to change um, your configuration in. Um, so have separate files for different parts of your configuration. And that's it for Flow. Uh, a lot of stuff has happened, but um, this is just a small overview. Um, if you if you need any details, hit me up on Slack or um, in Discourse. Um, but yeah, a lot has changed under the hood, uh, but we tried to keep it manageable for you, let's say, while also providing a lot of uh, future possibilities. Um, important though, we have a lot of plans for flow and we are looking into different directions. I think Robert said something about this as well. Um, so we, we are obviously looking into making our lives easier and also making the framework more accessible to a broader range of developers while keeping the CMS um, as it is. So um, yeah, we are thinking about a lot of options and I think um, the changes for PSR compatibility are definitely a good thing and we will see what else needs to happen um, yeah, to get to that. So talking about Fusion, a lot has happened in Fusion specifically, so I put it up as a separate topic. Um, and first of all, prototype generators are now deprecated and removed from the default node types. So um, if you rely on that, you would need to adapt. Um, you might not even know what prototype generators or default prototype generators are, but you certainly profited from them in a way. Um, it's basically that you could um, create a node types YAML for a content element and then um, just write the prototype, give it a template file path and you were done more or less because, um, or even put, just put the template file in the, in the path you knew because it had a convention um, and then you would be, would be done and you had your node type. That's obviously nice and it worked fine for a long while. Uh, but as we are moving more and more into fusion-based rendering and AFX, um, we found that giving templates as default is not sensible anymore. And we also wanted to um, create a better understand, uh, understanding of the code you have. Uh, the prototype generators basically generated a magic prototype that was never visible, but that was there for the system that said this is a template and it has a template file in this place and these are the, uh, the uh, properties uh, that we extracted from the node type and gave it to the template. Um, now you have to do that yourself um, which brings way more clarity to your code because uh, now you see what actually happens and the error messages are clearer uh, before there could be errors because the template file was not there but you never configured the template so it was unclear why there was a requirement for template and um, now that is all gone and you basically are responsible for your own rendering now. So then we worked on the Fusion MVC view. This is kind of a flow feature, if you like. Um, but as we as we do so much with Fusion now and rendering uh, in Fusion and AFX, we wanted to make that also easier in flow applications. So um, we improved on the Fusion view class that existed before. Uh, it was just hard to to use because the configuration was not obvious and uh, to get it to load specific files. Um, you actually had to go into that and now you can easily configure via views YAML um, 
your fusion view and where your um, fusion files are for this view. And it will automatically even map to a fusion path depending on your controller name and the action name. Um, so you can have a defined structure for your flow application controllers um, using Fusion, uh, which makes it much easier to use. Um, I don't have a code example for that, but um, you can look, look it up in the, in the um, documentation. Uh, it would have been a bit long code example and I felt no one would follow it if you don't type it at that moment. Uh, but it's a nice idea to look it up um, if you want to have a unified rendering everywhere and actually want to reuse Fusion components in your Flow application. Uh, that goes for plugins as well, of course. Uh, next up, we have Fusion Fonts now. This is um, a huge effort from Martin. Thanks for that. It's amazing because one thing that obviously was missing in Fusion was the possibility to create uh, forms in a similar way as in Fluid uh, forms were possible. Um, and I'm not talking about the form framework, which is more of a uh, very structured way of creating forms, but really making it easier for your application to have forms uh, rendered. Um, so before, if you think that would be the, uh, the other hindrance in uh, switching a flow application to uh, Fusion rendering, uh, first of all, the Fusion view that we solved, but also your application very likely has some kind of form in there. And um, with the Fusion forms, you can replace that in Fusion. Um, again, I don't have a code example here because I think it would just be confusing. Um, but uh, despite having some different concepts, because obviously the Fluid forms are quite old, uh, we renewed some of the ideas. The general idea is very much the same, that you create uh, fields and um, define action, an action for the form and all that. And you are pretty much free for rendering it however you like. Um, but in the end, you have a form that can map variables and uh, properties and that can be sent to your controller. Uh, so that's nice. Uh, then uh, data structures were simplified, also super small change, but totally helpful if you write um, a lot of code that outputs JSON or any kind of data structure in Fusion because before you would have something like that, a lot of repetition of data structure, data structure, data structure. Uh, although it's totally understandable if you see this, uh, that this also makes a lot of sense and it works now. Um, so basically what happens is whenever inside a data structure, um, a subkey has uh, no, no object given. Uh, we just assume you want a data structure, which makes sense. Uh, obviously on the top level, we cannot assume because there you're coming from somewhere else. You're probably in a component or something. So the first data structure you need to give and then any sub data structure is assumed unless you create another fusion object that is not a data structure, then inside you would have to uh, name data structure again, of course. But then again, nested in there, uh, you are free to uh, get rid of the next level data structures. Uh, so yeah, that makes, makes it much easier to write, but also much easier to read later on. Um, and actually, I feel uh, makes it way more viable to write uh, bigger structures in fusion. Right, HTML structures, uh, comments. Another thing um, now works uh, very simply. They are not, they are not um, parsed at all, uh, but it allows you to quickly copy paste some markup you get um, from someone else into your AFX. So this is AFX obviously. Um, and it will work even if there are HTML comments in there before that would lead to an error because uh, we couldn't deal with uh, the comments itself. Then performance, that's a big topic and we have a couple of changes um, and I think not all of them are in yet, but um, some are in and uh, especially if you have a bigger application, lots of fusion, uh, you will see the difference. Um, so this, this is a lot of, a lot of low level rendering um, changes that hopefully have no impact on you or your code, 
um, they just make the execution of it faster. So um, yeah, report any errors that you find, but hopefully uh, everything works as before, just faster. And then we come to the back end, uh, the next big part. Uh, a lot has happened here too. Um, the back end has grown up a lot. Um, and between small details, also larger things have changed and improved, and I will show you what it is. So first of all, Ember.js, obviously uh, not used since a long while, uh, still lingering around in the Neos package for legacy reasons, and it's pretty much, uh, pretty much gone now. There's uh, still a very small leftovers that we need to remove as far as I know, but um, that will also soon be gone. Um, but yeah, we don't use it anymore, so uh, you should probably switch over to React by now as well. Uh, then we can have trees with different root nodes. This is a totally developer topic. This is not something you simply configure. You need to uh, use that in your own um, UI extension. But uh, there you can now make use of the, the trees we have and just uh, instantiate one of those trees uh, with a different root node um, to create a specific tree for a subpart of your website, uh, a new section or a product section. Um, and as you might know from the flat nav example of Dimitri, you can uh, create tabs uh, above the tree and have different trees uh, at the same time. So this will help you uh, because now you you can not only have the trees plus some flat navs, but you can have different trees plus some flat navs if you want. Um, so that's also very nice for bigger um, projects. Uh, validation inline, uh, just a consequent uh, step. Um, so far, validation rules in no types apply to properties that were in the inspector, but never inline. Um, that was obviously annoying because sometimes you just want to validate something inline, especially text length or specific characters, um, stuff like that. Uh, this is now possible. They will be highlighted. So um, this will also uh, prevent um, this node from being published with uh, the validation failed in the inline editing. Uh, so yeah, make use of that. You can, you can now um, check for text length for all kinds of things, basically. Um, rich text in the inspector, basically the other way around. Uh, if you have text that you, for some reason, don't want to inline edit, but still need some uh, HTML options, uh, CK Editor 5 is obviously great, not only for inline, but also for, um, for uh, form-based form inline editing, form-based uh, rich text editing. And you can now create a, a CK editor for a inspector field that will open up in a secondary inspector and you can edit there with uh, whatever formatting you want. Um, that's all configurable in your node types. Then uh, the UI toolbar was improved. Uh, you will probably notice that yourself, but um, we moved uh, some elements uh, from the two toolbars at the top around. So now it ha makes a lot more sense to look at it and uh, it looks a bit cleaner um, and things have a better place now and don't disappear depending on what you select and stuff like that. Um, a lot of tiny usability changes have happened. You will also notice that if you side by side compare a 4.3 and a 5.2 installation, um, it's it's all kinds of things, small small changes in in, in icons and, and placement of stuff. You will you will see it. It's it's really helpful. The next few changes I want to show you some videos. So this video is um, a 4.3 installation where I do some stuff. So I'm in my demo site. I'm uh, clicking around. Obviously, I have my chapters. You know all this. And now I create a new page. I want to create a new chapter. And um, yeah, it takes some time. Um, so for the chapter, I can enter the name. That's nice. Um, so I'm coming up with something. And now I obviously also want to have a chapter picture. That's very important. Um, so I choose my picture. I need to upload it in the inspector. 
um, apply changes and be done. And now I want to rename that page because with the picture I have a better idea what it is. So I have a better name and obviously that means I need to change the URL path segment. And you see already that's a lot of steps that I need to take to do this. And um, now this is, this is a silly example. Obviously I could just move my new page up. Uh, but let's say I have a couple of pages that I need to move around. Um, what I need to do is click every single one, drag it to the place where it needs to be, take the next one, drag it to the place it needs to be. Uh, that's annoying and takes time. So. All right, and now we look at the same workflow for NEOS 5.2. You already see there's the interface improvements I talked about. I think it's very visible, even though it's small details. And I would just start the same here. I'm clicking around. I think you can get a feeling that it's a bit faster. It's the same system, same setup, um, everything the same. It's just the version difference. Um, and yeah, we try to improve the performance. And now you see I can not only enter the, the name here, but also select the chapter image because I can now configure um, whatever property I want to be um, accessible directly in the Create dialog for node types, which is super helpful um, to get the basics going. And again, I changed the name of this node um, <clears throat> because I have a better idea now. And again, I want to change the URL for that as well. And now we have a button that um, adapts the new title uh, to a URL path segment. So I don't need to do that myself, which is probably error prone, especially for uh, more complicated um, names. Right, and then um, I also want to move my nodes around. And um, for that, I uh, can now multi-select and drag uh, whatever nodes I have selected at the same time around. So moving stuff is uh, also way faster for editors. They don't need to drag one by one. What we saw here, node creation with properties and with whatever editors you have, that goes for custom editors as well. Um, so yeah, that works. Um, what doesn't work is editors that use a secondary inspector because obviously the creation dialog is in a modal and then the secondary inspector would go above. We are working on that, but right now it doesn't work. So you can drag new images in. You cannot open the media browser right now for image properties, for example. Um, but it's already super helpful to have like the basics for a new page in there and have an editor fill them while creating the node. Uh, the node URL updater, we saw that. It's just a small button. So you can now say, oh, I changed the title. I want to change the URL path segment. I just click the button and it updates. Uh, batch node operations. So you can, um, you can control, uh, click multiple nodes. Uh, it will also show you how many you selected and then you can just drag them together or delete them together. Um, do this kind of operations um, as a batch, which is super nice. Uh, then finally, some things unrelated to uh, the backend. You can uninstall the setup now, just a small thing, but it's nice for security, even though you could disable it before. But now you can actually uh, uninstall the setup package completely if you want to. Um, so then there's the full page cache. I mentioned that earlier. Um, uh, shortly. So the full patch cache um, makes use of the PSR7 implementation and it's really low level, just HTTP. And uh, it's a separate package, uh, flow pack full patch cache. Um, and it will um, work with NEOS, but you can use it for your own applications by using cache headers. Um, and the idea is that it will cache any cacheable that is get request without uh, get arguments. Um, and it will just cache the whole um, response. So it links into the HTTP workflow in the beginning and in the end. Um, we will start at the end part. So if, an, uh, if some request went through the whole stack and finally there's a response, it's ready to, de be, de to be delivered. Um, this full page cache kicks in, checks if um, all requirements are given. So 
Um, no one is locked in. We have only a GET request. So whatever, everything that is needed to responsibly make this cacheable, and we have some headers that say it's cacheable, um, it will actually cache that. And uh, for Neos, for example, we uh, will transport the cache tags uh, into the full patch cache, so it will be flushed automatically, uh, uh, just as your normal uh, Fusion cache. Um, so, okay, we have our cache entry, and now in the beginning of the chain, when a new request comes in, we check if we have a cache entry for this kind of request, and again, if no one is locked in. And in that case, we can deliver um, the cache response right there and not go deeper into the stack, which allows for extremely fast response times. Um, so you can you can locally on my system I can come down under 10 milliseconds uh, on a remote system obviously that will be longer but it's still a massive improvement to uh, just going through the whole stack even even if the fusion and content is cached. Um, Backend loading times have been improved by various changes, uh, especially in caching of uh, metadata that we download uh, for for the editing experience, but that we actually don't need to download every time someone changes a page. So um, that is gone now. Uh, some other small improvements, uh, really nice. Uh, you will feel that difference. And then finally, uh, a very nice feature, you can now, if you export the nodes to the, uh, to the uh, XML structure, um, you, it will export tags and collections for the media files as well. So on the import, um, the tags and collections will be there as well, uh, which is nice because th those, this information was lost before and obviously that makes not, not much sense to restore a full system. Um, so now that, that works as well. Right, and then we have multi-authentication providers for backend users. That's nice if you want to authenticate from different sources, not only username, password, but also external providers, Google or whatever. Um, there are some small problems we are tackling right now, but in general, I think it's a good direction to look at that and allow you more flexible ways to authenticate your backend users for more security, for example. Right, um, that's the quick overview over the changes and the evolution and actually revolution in some ways of uh, NEOS and Flow between uh, NEOS release 4.3 and uh, now 5.2. Um, a lot is uh, ongoing and, and in the works. You will see a lot of talks about stuff. Um, we have some longer going projects um, like the media browser rewrite and also the uh, event source content repository. Um, and we will talk about all that. Uh, but this is what you need to know uh, if you upgrade now and what your editors can expect and what you can expect in developer experience. And I think it's a nice upgrade um, from last year. So I hope you enjoy your upgrade. And um, if you have any questions, uh, hit me up. My contact details are here. Uh, thanks for listening. And um, hopefully see you next year in person at the NEOS conference. Hi, Christian. You just said see you next year, but we see you now. Indeed. Hi. We well, I don't, hey, I, don't, I don't actually see you. Ah, there but he is. <laughs> Hi, Christian. Hi. Oh, you, that was a very quick costume change. Weren't you wearing a gray shirt a second ago? <laughs> yeah, but, you know, after talk, you need to, sweat, you need to change up ah, things. Right. Sweaty? Yeah. Mm. yeah. I know. <laughs> it was very, very exciting. Um, we had a question, I think, on the big blue button. Some, I saw a question somewhere um, where someone asked whether the changes that you were just talking about have already found their way into um, the documentation. And we thought that would be a good opportunity to talk to you about documenting things, asking questions, how to make questions and their answers respectively more permanent. Right. Um, as for the documentation, um, definitely the bigger changes should be uh, updated in the documentation. Uh, but as always, the yeah, documentation has grown quite big by now, and we have basically two places for documentation, so keep that in mind. If you're looking for something, we have uh, docs in SIO, which should be your main uh, portal to, to look for stuff. 
Um, this is, I would say, I would call it handwritten documentation, uh, nice guides and information. Um, but there's also a link to our Read the Docs uh, page. This is more reference information, so it's mostly directly uh, extracted from the code. Um, stuff like uh, Fusion helpers are documented there, uh, what they can do, what we have. Um, and across all this, there's a, a lot to keep track of. So if you see something that feels outdated to you, uh, let us know because we probably don't know it. Uh, it's, it's uh, I mean, developers and documentation, we all know, we all know the problem. But um, in general, if it's not updated, it's mostly a question of we didn't know there was something to update, uh, especially if there is some code example in another part of the documentation that references something that was now changed. We might have not found it or not seen it. Uh, so there might be old HTTP code, for example, in some plugin documentation because never we didn't think about changing the plugin documentation. Um, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, let us know, definitely. We will update it, but all the big changes should be updated in the documentation. Um, so additionally, if you... Christian, sorry, uh, yeah. what, what is a good way? How should people let us know to do updates to the documentation or how can they do it themselves? Sure, they could also do it themselves, at least for um, Docs and ESIO. You can request a, um, an account for, for that website. It's a normal NEOS website, so you should, should have an idea how to edit stuff in there. <laughs> um, just hit one of the core team members up and we will set you up with an account for that. Um, you can also let us know in, in Slack or um, Discourse um, or via mail, um, whatever you prefer. Um, uh, at least if you know that's something and if you can fix it, even better. Um, also, in general, if you ask questions in Slack, um, it would be cool if you got an answer to post the question and the answer to Discourse. That would help everyone because it's more easy to find there. Um, it's it's easier to find by Google, and um, in the end, it's a more permanent storage than than Slack, let's say. And that's a um, very important yeah. thing you're saying there. Um, this Slack is very nice to get some ad hoc help and you know direct synchronous interaction with core team members, um, but you know for for people who are not that close um, to the core team. Probably a web search engine is the first place they go, right? And Slack is not indexed by those. So, um, as Christian said, putting up your questions and the answers you got and that helped you on Discourse. So, go to discuss.neos.io um, and put, put them up there so other people can find them. Just the same as you look at on Stack Overflow or something like that. Um, help us make those answers findable. Um, <laughs> That can only improve uh, everyone's NEOS and Flow experience. And I think for um, for comments, questions, feedback regarding the documentation, especially there's a there's a separate channel on Slack, right? NEOS help NEOS dash documentation maybe a minute. Uh, a guild <laughs> documentation. Guild yeah. documentation. Guild guild documentation. Thank you. Um, and I, I keep seeing, especially recently, there was someone, I'm sorry, I f forgot who, who contributed greatly with articles and to-dos and how-tos. And so there's active um, participation from, from plenty of people. So what I can add to that, um, just I think last week we had a NEOS meetup, um, online NEOS meetup organized by uh, Sebastian Helsle and I think Daniel from Punkte E. And... Uh, we had a talk there. Roland Schütz uh, was talking about the documentation as well. So um, it is a topic that's definitely on our mind. Documentation can never be up to date enough, can never be accurate enough. And of course, you know, as everybody develops code, it, it changes and gets outdated automatically. So um, please help uh, in keeping it updated if you find something that doesn't work or if you know you stumble across an example that, that's not working. Um, and there's also a recording available of the meetup, so um, we, can, we can post that link again um, so you can review what Roland had to say about the documentation. Um, but coming back to, to your talk, Christian, um, 
you talked about Neos 5x and, and Flow 6x. Um, let's let's switch our perspective into the future. There's an LTS version coming up, and after that, um, the cycle says there is a new major version. Do you have some sneak previews for us? What's what's waiting around the Tell corner? Tell us the secrets. <laughs> Uh, I think it's it's really hard to predict what will go in. I mean, we we always need to decide on uh, on shorthand what is what is actually ready to get into a release. Um, obviously, we have lots of plans, and I don't want to spoil it too much because there are talks about about future plans uh, coming up. So um, watch those <laughs> definitely. Watch the rest of the talks um, if you want to know what's coming. But um, so I think we you, are. You don't have to commit to anything, but if you could break something in the next major, what would it be for you? Ah, oh, if I could break anything in the next major. Ooh, um, ah, there, there's there's uh, there's actually a lot of small topics, but nothing at, at this point, nothing really big. Where I say I I, w I definitely want to I want to break it right now. Um, I'm, 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 you know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting more content now. The, the, the longer <laughs> I do this, I'm getting more content with the state we have. Um, there's, there's, I guess I would, I would look into, into resources and media. Maybe there's, I think there's some, some things to tackle, but I think nothing to break actually. Um, so we do have um, the last talk tomorrow is about the new media module. I think Sebastian Helsela will talk a, a bit about that. I'm, yes. I'm very excited. Um, media management is a big thing. When I think of our own website, which is really, really small, and we already have more than a thousand assets in there and, you know, finding and organizing uh, stuff um, is always a big topic. So I'm really looking forward to, to that talk. Um, exactly. All right. Christian, um, apart from from coding um what was your experience in the community during corona times did you have a chance to spend more time on the social media or how was it for you personally i was super busy mostly because the clients i deal with moved into into home office as well obviously so there was way more video uh, video meetings than before um which always needs full attention so um it's it's hard to to do something on the side uh which meant the last few months were really a blur for me um i i didn't manage to do much much else and uh, we know that you're a veteran speaker at um, various conferences um how was this experience different yeah, it's funny. It's the first time I actually d did this in 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 that way, um, and it's it's interesting. Um, as Robert mentioned in in Big Bull Big Bull Blood and Love chat, uh, <laughs> that happens to me all the time. Yeah, uh, um, it's it's difficult without an audience because you 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 want to get a feel for the room and and have an idea uh, how people react to what you say. If uh, if you see lots of confusion, you want to slow down, stuff like that. <laughs> so, um, having not having that, it was mostly my pace. So um, I tried to get into details wherever I thought it was necessary. But on the other hand, um, you don't know what's necessary. And also the whole technical setup, it's so much more complicated uh, <laughs> to, to get... Uh, a good audio recording, a good video recording, uh, while having the slides and recording ideally also the screen with the slides. Um, uh, that it's it's uh, it's <laughs> a lot of effort, but I, I think it's worth it, and it's it's good that we do this and and have something this year. Uh, so it was absolutely worth it. Um, I prefer the actual stage. I think. I understand that. <laughs> it is kind of strange sitting here and talking to four screens and three cameras and not having <laughs> any sense of did my joke land <laughs> yes. yeah, yeah at least you know the, the people behind behind all the cameras are laughing sometimes so Some, that's, sometimes that's nice. yeah. um what I wanted to mention is we, I think we had more than 150, 160 viewers during the last talks. So thank you very much to everyone watching the live stream right now. And, um, you know, keep up the discussions. I did see um, a lot of community interactions in Big Blue Button. 
difficult word. You will, can say it. I will practice it <laughs> during the next two days. Um, and also on Slack. So really awesome. Um, thank you, Christian, for being there all the time, answering questions, helping out, um, being the friendly ghost that you are. Um, and, you know, I, I, I wanted to make a compliment about your shirt and, you know, the awesome background you put up for the video call. It's very fashion. Yeah. Yes, I try. I try. <laughs> But yeah, See that I mean, one I'm, landed. I'm also, <laughs> indeed, it did. I'm also around. Um, hit me up uh, in Big Blue Button or Slack if you if you want to chat or hang out or whatever. Um, I try to be around today and tomorrow. Thank you very much for your talk about the Neos and Flow five and six revolution. It was a pleasure listening to you explaining what has changed in the last versions. And, you know, although we didn't get too much of a sneak peek for what's coming up with the next major, um, there is an LTS version coming up. So Neos 5 is the way to go right now. I can only encourage the community to upgrade. Um, with our release schedule and release roadmap, it's always a good idea to go up to the, to the newest version um, the uh, I think it's the 3.3 LTS which is going to go out of support very soon so that, that, um, is, yeah, that is definitely out <laughs> if you're still on a version before that it's high time that you upgrade your Neos and, and Flow projects and if you're uh, running the 3.3 LTS do start planning your upgrade path um, it takes some effort And Christian described some of the changes we put in in the last version, um, but it's absolutely worth it. As as Christian, as you said, um, Neos gets better all the time, and you find less and less fault with it. What's going on? <laughs> <laughs> I mean that that should be the goal, right? Um, obviously, there will be no new things coming up, and uh, we will always change. That's I think that's in the core of Neos and the team that we want to go in the future and change. Uh, accordingly. When we look at the event source content repository, there will be a lot of things we we need, we need to fix. <laughs> exactly. All right. Christian, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you and the team. Have a good time. <laughs>